Talk Shop Podcast Season 2, Episode 6. Welcome back, everyone. Today, I will be talking with creator and director Jordan Taper about his series Fight On and the lead actor John McCord. We talk about the process that went into making this audio drama, some of the choices John made as the lead actor, what Jordan's direction and process was to create this audio drama series. The audio drama will be linked in the description as well as all of their information, so feel free to check it out. We also go into what inspired making this audio drama fight on and all the parts that went into getting it to move. Check out the interview now. Welcome back to the Talk Shop Podcast, and today I got with me my guest, Jordan Taper, the creator of Fight On, which we'll be talking about in a bit, and one of the actors, or the main actor, from the series, John McCord. How's it going, guys? I'm doing good. How about you? Pretty good. Pretty good. Jordan, how about you? I'm doing great. That's great. That's great. Okay, so we're going to talk a bit about Fight On right after we get some introductions from the both of you on basically what it is you do, as well as how this even came along, which will then lead into talking about Fight On. So let's start with Jordan. Jordan, what is it that you do? Um, So I am a writer of stories. It's a passion I've had for the past four to five years. Um, I am not a, this is not my profession. I have my real life job profession that I'm very happy about. I just felt like I have these story ideas in my head and it's just fun to get them out and then just show them and to the world see what people think. Um, and I want to say late 2021 is when I wrote this story, not fight one, I wrote my first story and that I wanted to online. But then I thought I want to make an animated series on this and put it on YouTube or Newgrounds, but that would cost me a whole lot of money that I don't have. And it would take me like three years to get one series of like 10 to 12 episodes. So I did research. I found Casting Call Club. It's a godsend for writers, directors, voice actors, everybody. Everything you need is right there. That was the process to make and direct my first audiobook based on stories I've written, based on that one. So I love that process. I love finding incredible voice actors like the one we have here today. And I just love that. And <laughs> another story, directed another audiobook, then another one, it just kept going because I had all these story ideas. And that's what we've been doing for the past uh, four, four to four and a half years. And I, I, it's for me, it's really important to um, highlight the amazing work these voice actors do and redirecting them. And um, I make sure to post my my audiobooks on like social media and things like that. Create I create a few IMDb's of my some audiobooks to really help voice actors get the get their names out there because it's extremely competitive industry and I feel like even the tiniest bit I can do to help on their journeys I'm willing to do is a way to, for me to say thank you for helping make my passion a reality. That's good. Nice, nice. And I agree. Oh, and by the way, people, those IMDb's for the show we're talking about and probably the others as well will be linked below. So how about you, John? What is it that you do? Because you were one of the voice actors in Fight On. You played Gage, which... I ended up finding your Twitter earlier today because I was like, let me go check the IMDb. And I was like, oh, hey, look at it. But what is it that you do? <laughs> well, let's see. I've been a voice actor for, let's see, I guess this makes it almost four years now. Hard to believe it's already been that long since I started. But outside of that, I've been working as an admissions clerk for a hospital uh, where I live for about, I guess, almost three years now. Cool. cool. Let's see. I, I, yep, I first started in, I think it was November of 2020. When I saw that um, these big personalities, Ashley Nichols and Dave Captivale, I think that's how you say his last name, they released a casting call for their upcoming animated pilot, Far Fetched. I figured, you know, if I'm going to try this, might as well do it then. So I got a cheap little microphone kit off eBay for about $40. It came with the microphone and the microphone arm. I cobbled together a little demo reel did the best I could. Um, I submitted that. And then after that, I found out about Casting Call Club. And I think this little sub page on behind the voice actors that also had a bunch of other casting calls. And that's just how I got the ball rolling. Nice, nice. Yeah, you know, we all start somewhere. I remember when I was first starting, I, I did definitely similar things. So it's always great to hear how people are starting. Now, speaking of starting, 
let's start talking about the show in question right now that Jordan you you wrote and produced and as well as cast fight on what is it that basically brought you to make this idea become a reality because I was I was listening to the whole thing today thank you by the way because it got me through work all right I do not like my nine to five sometimes and this this time is really enjoying my time but I'm hearing this I mean I'm hearing this uh, show and it's definitely giving me those Tokyo Revengers vibes, the anime vibe, a windbreaker, and those kind of genres as well. And I think it was like episode six where I really started getting chills from like John's performance after uh, you play Gage, whose mom was taken hostage. Spoiler alert, sorry guys. Um, so t- <laughs> so let's, let's start at the beginning of where it is and how it is you came up with this idea, Jordan. Um, so this... If the story happened, oh gosh, I want to say sometime in 2022. And there's this, you mentioned shows like Tokyo Avengers, which I'm a big fan of, Windbreaker, one of my favorite new anime of this year. And I had seen a show that, um, first of all, I should say, I'm obsessed with anime. I always say proud of Taku right here. I have no shame. Like right all my on. stories have a huge, have a huge anime influence because of like the storytelling and the characters and everything. It's like it's like endless possibilities and like like these artists and writers in Japan that their imaginations can just go anywhere. And it's so inspiring to me. And um there is this anime that's really popular and some people may know that anime does not have to have an English dub to be popular in America. And I honestly, honestly don't usually watch me subbed anime just because I want to watch anime, not read it. I like, to, and I also like to hear the incredible voice acting performances. But there's this anime called Banana Fish, and I, I knew nothing about it. I heard that title, I'm like, what? What does that mean? And then I kind of got the idea of it, and kind of has this like street gang vibe with like warring gangs, and I'm like, oh, this sounds interesting. And oh, I watched it on a whim, and became obsessed with it, which was a blessing and a curse, because it kind of traumatized me for two reasons. One, because of how it ended, which I'm obviously not going to say, I'm not going to say more than that or spoil anything, but it left me traumatized. We'll bleep out and the spoilers. Two, yeah. Um, <laughs> and I think even, I know, but even for me, even worse than how it ended for me was the fact that there's no English stuff. That I, I've had to really accept the fact that I'll never be an English sub of this show. Otherwise, because of how popular it is, again, even in America, it would have happened by now. So at the time, I was just traumatized. I didn't know how to move on. And then I, I joked, John may have heard me say this before. I wrote Fight On to move on from that show. And so I decided, what if I did like an American reboot of that? When there's still an anime flair to it. And I just wrote this kind of original idea. Some scenes that some people have seen Banana Fish, and if they listen to Fight On, some scenes I came up with came directly from that series, but kind of done in my own way. Um, and I just kind of love that idea. I, I did change some things around, obviously. And so for me, my idea for Fight On was the idea, I, I like the fact that I like characters in anime who are really cool, tough badasses, but also like nice, good people at the same time, uh, which is one of the reasons why I love, one of the reasons why I love Book of Avengers and Windbreaker, like the action, all that stuff, and like, like gang wars are exciting, but it's the characters and they seem like real people. That's what I love about that. Um, and so that's how I created Gage. And he's, um, you know, he's a gay. I, I love this idea of him being a tough gang leader who, as, as the secondary character Anthony, the other main character Anthony would say, says something like, Gage, I never thought I'd be someone like you. It's just gang leader who would kill anyone if you had to, but you're also protective and funny and nice. And, I, and that's kind of what I want to gauge. To be and I, I cannot thank John enough for bringing all of that of his personality to to Gage and he's his mom was not his mom his dad was the um, former leader of his gang. I also like the idea, which was like windbreaker, of gangs that aren't bad. They're not mean. They're not you know they don't kill people or steal. They're just trying to get by. And his dad was killed, a rival gang leader who also now is. Um, it's cohort, cohorts with a corrupt businessman. We're trying to kill Gage and his gang to get to the top. And then 
Um, so the age of 21, remember this 18 year old college kid named Anthony who literally just started college, was bullying high school and wants to, you know, move on from that and be more confident. He, and he's a journal, a journalist um, major, and he's from a mentor or or somebody for journalists, and he didn't expect going to break out of this weak shell he was in high school meant to do research on street gangs, and he's kind of thrown into this war between Gage's gang and this other gang, and corrupt businessmen, um, and it seems like Gage is probably the scariest guy out of all the ones that he sees, but there's, they create this, like, brother connection, this older, younger brother connection, and how Gage teaches Anthony to, um, to believe in himself, to stand up for himself and Anthony kind of gives Gage the strength to fight on everything he's going through and of course Gage also has his mom who we see in one of the episodes again I love the idea of this tough bass gang leader who actually has a great relationship with his mom because that doesn't happen um and I just for me the most important thing about any story is the characters something about them that you love and about them that you absolutely hate and you can't wait like for the villains you cannot wait for them to get taken down because they deserve it with everything that they put the main characters through like all of that just kind of together and i can honestly say with john here it's my favorite other john i've done you know it came from a it started in a painful place with the way the banana fish ended and there's not going to be an english dub but to mourn that um i just wrote this story and directed the audio drama it's my favorite i've done Nice, nice. Yeah, I, I can see that. And it was it's really fun to listen to. So speaking of Gage, okay, I'm going to talk to John about this, which, as you mentioned, Gage is like this badass because I, I could hear it while I'm listening to this, that Gage, he's a gang leader. Clearly, he's intimidated. People are intimidated usually at first glance. But the guy's got personality. He's a, he's a character. And he has more than just, oh, hey, I can kick someone's ass. Speaking of which, John, like, when you got captured, then you broke out. So, bro, you were like at eleven on this stuff. Like, Anthony, why are you? Where? I was like, I was like, damn, dude. Like, what the? F-? So, <laughs> yeah. That's all I, you can imagine how I felt when I heard his audio track. So it's episode six, and yeah, it was. Those are like that, that was amazing. I, I'm hearing this. I'm like, I'm like, bro, this guy is this guy's on it. So for me personally. I, I love seeing other actors just really be able to commit to the craft, and that's what you were doing, John. So let's start. When you, I, I, I'm assuming you auditioned for this. What is it that drew you to audition for this project? Well, first of all, I want to say thank you very much to both of you. It was a great time uh, recording for this project. So um, I remember, I can't remember what I was doing at the time, but I remember that Jordan uh, emailed me and asked me to audition for his project. So I think it was Gage that I tried out for. And, you know, one thing led to another, I got the part. So um, every now and then, whenever I wouldn't be at work and I'd have enough time, I would go over to another house of a friend, a family friend, to record in their basement. And let's see, I would keep, I would just read over the script, uh, I wouldn't really have a lot of time to go over every every other part, just enough to go over my part and I just whichever character I was interacting with, and you know, I just made sure that I could do it in an adequate amount of time. But for those parts where I really just took it up to eleven, um, it felt really good to do because you know I do watch anime too and a bunch of other things too. A lot of the time, I feel like um, the actors that I hear. I feel like they, I always think I listen to them and I think I probably would have gone a lot, gone a bit stronger there. So I just like to do what I want to hear in the stuff that I watch. And mm-hmm. and that makes sense too. Cause like first you're hearing, first I'm hearing Gage just be this character like, yeah, what's up? How's it going? And then he gets captured. He gets, he gets captured. He gets sliced. He gets brought shot a few times and then dude just like oh i'm like bro i hope his voice is okay <laughs> oh yeah yeah i did need need some rest after those those times and i think it was chapters six and seven or eight right but yeah i did need some time off after that <laughs> right on. yeah I, I would think so like you're like god like the last time i was re- yelling in the studio i was like okay hold on give me a second and but it was really cool to see that commitment that 
you're working with Jordan. He's wrote this really cool and and real script, and then you're committing to bringing the best out of it, and it's working too. I'm like, I'm like, yeah, Gage is he's like, on it. Yeah, Gage is he's on it. And, and so it was great to see. And so it was great to see. So aside from that, so, what are some of the other things that what what did this process teach you when you were uh, playing Gage? Well, let's see. At first, um, I've heard some. I've heard some advice. I read this on D. Bradley Baker's website on how to be a voice actor, and I think I also heard this uh, advice also from KG Tang when I took a vocal training class with him. Oh, cool. To just, whenever you're not voice acting, um, just try to watch stuff, play play things to try and pull inspiration from. So. That's what it started out at first, but as we went on, I started injecting more and more of myself into the role. So instead of thinking, how would this character do this? Instead I was thinking, how can I, how can I sort of spice this up? So that's how it just progressed as I, as I got through the story. Nice, that's cool. Uh, for those who don't know KG Tang, I believe that is Gojo from uh, yes it is yeah okay just i was like i'm pretty sure that's gojo yes and, that's yeah, right yeah de definitely <laughs> yeah more about this topic when you were casting for these characters what were some of the things going through your mind because you're casting you're directing okay and then you're following up as well and then there's probably a bunch of other stuff that gotta that have to be taken care of and you gotta balance all these things how did you to start how did you cast these characters and what did you have in mind when looking for them in in, in fitting these roles so oh, something that i do that i feel is really helpful for both of me and voice actors who are auditioning is i think about anime characters that i've seen and think oh they would really fit these characters um for example the first audio book i did um, the first story was called zane the demon prince and the lead girl is melody um, her name is Melody, and I created the character exactly, I mean, exactly like Toru Honda from Fruits Basket, because my favorite anime of all time. And the sweet girl, she lost her dad when she was like three. She lost her mom a year ago when she was like 14, 15. Her mom was her whole world, her everything. But despite that, she's always so positive, and she sees the good in people. And that's exactly how I created Melody that way. And I'm really happy that I did. And the voice I just like, found fit that sweet sweet personality perfectly so i look at any characters you think would fit this really well so for anthony who's voiced by an amazing voice actor who i really wish could be here today named ryan tibbetts who's right. like 20 so he fits anthony perfectly that way um i found the character uh, makoto tachibana from the anime free for example a swimming sports anime who was like the nicest guy yep an anime probably ever um and i really and i really feel like is you know he's a captain of the swim team and there's these he's around his friends so he's up to somebody who would stick up for his friends and i feel like um and i feel like ryan fit that personality perfectly when he when he auditions anthony and then my cast doing the whole thing especially with this like brother connection he has you know that anthony has with, with gage and the main villain his name is um samuel and i found the character makashima from the anime Psychopaths, a show that I'm like obsessed with. It's someone it's amazing and mm -hmm. and just I love how Makashima is not the classic over the top villain who has to does crazy laughs and stuff. He's much more grounded. He's very conniving and aloof and that voice actor who he he brought it. He he knew exactly what I was going for. I have to say I've done a few uh I guess some interviews like this, but I guess they're less formal, like just some discourse servers I'm in about voice actors. And I would give like advice about what a director is looking for. And for me, if I don't, if I can tell someone puts in an audition where they're not looking at the notes I gave them, like try to, like this anime character. It doesn't have to be exact. Try just try to really get in the ballpark of what I'm looking for. Because if I give you a description of a character and there's no image, because this is all audio, that may not be enough, and you may not know what voice the director is looking for. So to make up for that, I show you a picture of an anime character. I give you a link to where you can watch the series um, in English dub. And if I just see this right on any kind of audition, I'm like, okay, that's something they're not directable. 
It makes me feel like I'm wasting my time. This is not what you want to do when you're auditioning for something. So um, I think of anime characters that I think will fit a perfect fits for this character, and I think that really helps voice actors get into the mindset of what voice fits this character best. But it's beneficial for me because it makes casting easier. If I have a, and there are times where I have a lot of auditions for a character. What helps me weave them out is who looked at my notes, who did their research, who didn't. And the ones, and that also tells me who really wants this character, who really wants to be a part of this. Definitely. And, and that's important too because it's like you get all these auditions and then you got to pick the one that works, you got to pick the one that fits for it. And it's just not all the time when you know, unless you actually know the person, then it's like, hmm. I need to gauge, <laughs> gauge. Uh, <laughs> thank you. Who who would fit this character, both voice wise and acting wise? And yet you had a plethora of characters there. I heard Anthony. I was like, whoa, Anthony is just like this, it, it, the newcomer here. Who's uh, he doesn't know what it's like on the streets. All right, he's sitting there like, oh yeah, I'm a journalist. I'm trying to be a journalist and go to college. And then the next thing you know, he's in a firefight out in the middle of the street. And you, you have this character, Anthony, which is which I'm really also hearing from his, from their part, from Anthony's part. I'm hearing that acting ability really start to kick in with his interactions with Gage. So Gage goes from like, yeah, you know, it's about vengeance things to really understanding. Um, to understanding that I have something to lose, which was really, which really came through and communicated well when John was playing this gauge. When you got these lines, John, and you had those interactions, because you probably weren't in the same. I don't, I don't know if you were recording at the same time as Anthony or just record and send lines. Oh yeah, no, it was completely remote. So I would record my lines, and then Jordan would would get. I would send Jordan my lines, and then along with all the other lines from the other actors, right. uh, he would put them all together. So, Perfect. completely separate. Cool. So, with that being the case, because you didn't actually have a scene partner there, how was it that you tackled some of these scenes that were more, like, emotional, knowing that, you know what, I, I got to look out for Anthony because he, there's, he's not going to survive on the streets. Come on. All right? He shouldn't even be out here to begin with. How is it that you brought that more brotherly protection to it in those like very special moments with him. Well, I do remember it being a little tough at first because you know when you're recording remote, of course, I did have there was some direction from Jordan on the script, but mostly when you record remote, you sort of act as your own casting direct or not casting voice director. So, you know, I do remember having to redo a couple lines because I just didn't think they didn't think that didn't think that they sounded right. So I'd keep redoing it until it sounded just right to me. And that's pretty much just how it went. Right on. Cool. And then once you finally got like a feel for like, oh, this works, things, then it's like, all right, that works. And I'm sending that one out. That's, that's pretty good. I usually do the same thing as well. Yeah, that's exactly how it went. <laughs> perfect. So working on this project, you, you're the main character. Right, and you're going through like twelve episodes of stuff, and you're all because you're you're a storyteller at this point. All right, you're telling the story of Gage, and he goes from because I I remember too like after they took Gage away when he when they just ransacked the diner during there like that's when we started hearing really a lot of those things cranked up to eleven, especially like that reaction to seeing Gage or hearing Gage's mom. Um, be held hostage, and I was like, "Whoa, what? I was like, what, I was like, what the fuck's going on here?" <laughs> they, I was like, "Oh damn!" <laughs> they, like, like they're, they're pulling out hostages and everything, man. They was like, they, they're getting real." So, for those scenes like that, like when you're reacting to it, what are some of the things that were really going through your mind to really commit to the the stakes and the danger of it? Well, for that part, um, what really helped was. To imagine, you know, someone close to me being in that situation, and of course, you know, I wouldn't want them to be hurt, so I would just try to channel that into my performance, and yeah, that's pretty much how it was. <laughs> nice. Nice. That's pretty cool. So, Jordan, when you were writing these scenes uh, about, because it, it's, it's how do I put it? It was like 
It was almost like a wave. At some point, it's like, all right, things are going good. And then it went right into the rough waters where Gage is in conflict, things. When you were writing this, how is it that these ideas start to mesh together for you to really bring it out? Because what your writing sounds like is similar to how I would like write in my free time where I want it detailed so that the readers, or in this case listeners, can really experience what's going on. Um, for me, um, of course, having, again, Banana Fish as a starting up point, a point of inspiration really help because that so again it's like yes there's gang violence and stuff but it's really about that connection between the two characters who seem totally opposite um gage and anthony are a little bit different because there's a little more of an age different gage is 21 anthony is 18 um for pretty much all of my audio books audio dramas i want the characters to be real and i feel like i'm not afraid to put in those dark intense moments in shows that i've done and stories i've written and because I'm, it's just based on real life, there may be elements of fantasy here and there, but the characters are meant to, meant to represent real people and goes with really, like this audio, this audio drama especially, um, deals with a lot of hard themes like, you know, loss, grief, anger, revenge, maybe guilt. And that might be the hardest emotion to deal with really. But that's how Gage fell when he lost his dad. When um, Maddox, who's the rival gang leader who now works for Samuel, killed Gage's dad, Jude, and he's going through all that. And then meeting this college kid who seems pretty scared <laughs> um, at first, but um, I, I have to say, one of my favorite things about writing the series for me are two things. One, which is closer to what you asked, um, going back up and down with the emotional waves of being seen calm, but then, you know, the world they live in, any of them could die at any, at any moment. And I think for me, writing Anthony, he's a very relatable character in the sense that I want the readers to experience how they would feel in his position. Not really, in, I don't know if anyone can really relate to someone like Gage, even though he has all these players to him. It's easy to relate to someone like Anthony, who is in the middle of of this gang war, they did not know how this happened. Um, and, you know, he could get shot and killed at any moment, really. Um, but there's moments that, I'm, I don't know if John remembers these, where it's like in episode two, when he's captured by Max's gang, he comes up with this idea to, to get out and get help, where he like decides to go to the bathroom, then he gets to go to the bathroom, and then one of Max's gang members escorts him there. He turns around and rubs liquid soap in his eyes to get away. And oh yeah, I yeah, love I remember that. that. I, love, I love writing that scene. And then afterwards, when um, Anthony calls Gage and he hears about that, how Anthony got away, he says something like, "Damn, Anthony, who knew who knew such a nice guy could be such a bad?" And that's yeah. kind of what I was going for with someone like Anthony. Just got to come with something where he could die, Gage could die, and it just it makes him such a relatable character. So moments like that and. Then when they're at, I thought it was kind of funny how the audience doesn't know who this woman is in episode four that Gage knows. Mm -hmm. He's like, Gage, I miss you so much. And he's like, I see mom. Hmm. Mom? Like everyone except, um, <laughs> everyone except, uh, oh gosh, what's his name? Um, Kieran. Yeah. Who's also like Gage. He's like, you may think he's a tough gang member. He's actually this guy. Mm -hmm. And you know, and I thought that was kind of funny to put that in there and talk about her house, talk about all the trouble that Max has caused. And then Anthony gets mad and he comes up from his seat and he says, um, he says, Samuel and Maddox are nothing but cowards. Gage and his father are greater, are greater leaders than they could ever be. And it just shows a lot about who Anthony is. And Gage sees that and he realizes, wow, this kid is really willing to that up for him and 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 again episode six which, which i remember watching that scene from banana fish and it's just about how hatch rescues aging that's just that was so amazing and i just and i wanted to replicate that and and yeah there's moments where i have to say um this audio drama and a couple others i felt like mike mcfarland directing attack on titan and nice. that this is a controversial thing to say, but I have to say it. 
that show is like a giant middle finger to dub haters. You can't say anything about that dub. <laughs> like, it's perfect. And it is. I said it. I, I'm so sick of the dub versus sub thing. Like I yeah. said, except for Banana Fish, because it was something that drew me to it. I don't watch subs. Mm -hmm. I watch dubs because, like, 99% of dub haters don't even speak Japanese anyway. I'm like, it's, yeah. If they're, gonna, if they're gonna be petty i'm gonna be petty right back yeah there um, you go. and that that dub oh my god it's and everybody just went for it especially bryce happenberg mm -hmm. and i've seen a ton of panels online and he is like the happiest nicest guy he's always smiling must have do that california sunshine and yet you hear miss aaron yeager especially early on in the series and you're just like how does he have a voice after all that screaming not even as a child just as a regular human all that screaming he does that's kind of what i felt with john from episodes five through seven <laughs> and just like oh but which is what i was hoping for someone to really bring that intensity and, and that badassery and just and he delivered so there were moments i actually met, messaged him in during the process of the episodes and i was like hey i was wondering have you ever thought about getting into anime and then Dot, 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 because all oh, in capital letters, oh my god, you know how to scream. Uh, and, <laughs> and I'm sure John knows that every day we're screaming, and it's not easy. So you can pull it off when you've done something right. And it was just something like that was just amazing. Yeah, I, I definitely agree. Those are definitely the parts that stuck out because, um, <laughs> it, it I remember hearing some of the yelling, especially during the fights. It reminded me of Mikey from Tokyo Avengers and parts of that. Oh, for sure. Yeah. And the, the, you got that. And then I think at one point where he's breaking out of that complex after he um, – one of the one of the things that definitely stuck out to me when John was voice engaged was when he broke out the complex. And I'm probably going to mention this, like, to the point that it's just like, all right, Richie, you, you, you mentioned the complex now. <laughs> okay. I was like, well, I'm just saying it's good. So, but one part was when you were searching for Anthony – and it's it's like where is he? Where is he? It's Anthony, Anthony! And I was like, this guy's really looking. Okay, he's he really is actually looking around in a place which is a complex that he probably got brought to that he has no clue what's there. So it's like, uh, how do we? How do you spot somebody? Except you start yelling for their name. Okay, by the time you found him, okay, I I could have swore he had a weapon change in the middle of it. All right, it went from regular handgun to either automatic or automatic LMG <laughs> at some point. And then you find Anthony, he's like, all right, I'm going to get you out. And, stuff. and, and I'm now I'm just hearing Rambo, like 100%, just in the urban Rambo. I'm like, damn. <laughs> you, know what's funny? you know what's funny about that is um, after getting to know John and finding his social media and his Twitter, he's a huge fan of all snake from Mel Gear Salad. And it's so funny because looking back, mm. I'm thinking, oh, I guess he was just kind of doing like a younger version of that. Not like Bryden, not that there's anything wrong with Bryden, it was just a younger version of Salt Snake. And I was like, that would explain why he sounds so badass. Because that's probably what he was <laughs> thinking of. Uh, um, and yeah, and like even like the scream, like shouting he does at the end of episode four when he's getting pulled away from Isaac Enrington and and Satan. Um, these corrupt businessmen who work for Samuel, who their main goal is to get filthy rich, and they don't care who they kill to get so anyone who gets in their way. And, you know, he, Gage is telling his mom, you know, to run back to the cause while he still can. And looking back, that is, they kind of sound like something you would hear, like, in a classic action thing like Rambo or, like, in a military war game like Call of Duty or something with that kind of shooting. It's just right. It's those things because after I listened to this, I can't even count how many times it's the audio drama since we finished it. Um it was completely done November, December 2022. And you know, as the director, I'm listening to each episode as it's coming out, which everything sounds right. And then when it was done, I guess it's the whole thing from the first episode to the last. And I've listened to it a dozen times, maybe more, because I just that's my favorite thing I've done, and just everything that everything that John did, and he's bringing that intensity. Again, I felt like I oh, this is how Mike felt directing Attack on Titan, and all that intensity and the screaming to make you really feel for these characters. You know, you want you want Gage to find Anthony, you want him to get Anthony out of there, and everything um, because you just relate to them. 
so much and that performances help you do that you know if if gage was shouting something like anthony anthony where are you it would not it wouldn't get that sense of intensity or that sense right. of urgency mm-hmm. but hearing him shout the way that he did really makes you makes your heart beat really fast and like a feeling of urgency like where is he i it's like you're right there and it that's hard to do i feel for audiobooks and audio drama where there's no visual there's no animation you know it's all audio of performances and also the amazing audio engineers who mix everything add sound effects and music and all that make it more immersive definitely help too they're a huge part of it i'm sure john probably knows this um audio engineers whether it's audio dramas or animation they are the missing piece to bring it all together yeah. um, and all that came together for scenes like that definitely and i, and I agree because i'm hearing i'm also hearing these sound effects because I, I didn't know what to expect when i first when i turned on the first episode and then hearing these sound effects uh that are happening like uh, 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 the gunshot the gunshots i was like whoa whoa what <laughs> whoa thanks uh because i've been to the range and i've heard gunshots like that but they haven't shocked me as much because i had headphones on compared to this and it's just like it's it's like it's really going down out here you got that you got some of the music as well that was going on um especially when they either pull up to a place that's already blasting music it painted a really good picture along with the acting and the directing of things it painted a good picture of where are they what are they doing why are they here type of deal which was good to see or listen to in this case so it, it was and i think it was really enjoyable especially especially like near the latter parts where it definitely got a lot more serious with things um and i was like this this tone's changed things are a lot higher risk especially near the end and i'm just hearing these actors bring it i'm hearing the audio team the the audio mixing that was happening match that energy uh word for word as well yeah um also with audio dramas i've done in the last couple of years and i sh- i shifted to doing like an audio book like there's a big difference between audio books and audio dramas people can be really snobby about it um where it's just the voice actor reading their character's parts there's no music or sound effects and i thought i kind of want to make this more immersive because i felt like the story was being told to the audience i did i said he did he said um, and it was kind of written as like a book or a novel so i kind of shifted my approach to write like as a screenplay format and this probably started in early 2022 around there and and then i would add sound effects that are in bold black letters in the script music cue this whether it was you know sad piano music or driving hard rock music or something and then that would create things more immersive to give the audience more of a full picture and with there being no visual and it worked okay I, I got a full picture of where I was of what was going on the complex there I go mentioning the complex again uh him escaping in in you know fortified complex t- taking down others other other enemies okay I got a clear picture of that it worked and as voice actors we definitely know that our job is to paint that whole picture with just our voice compared to on stage mm-hmm. it's like oh i got everything set and i think john did a great job at that and really painting where it is you were at and what was going on um i i could see like the restaurant right there after it just got raided and then people are getting captured hostage situations going on things you having to surrender uh, just to protect your family. I could see all of that just based off your voice and every other's voices. Like, that that was really cool, honestly. Uh, thank you. Yeah, I'm, I think after I first finished the project, you know, I was thinking, yeah, I did a pretty good job. I probably could have done better. But recently I was listening over some of those parts, like, you know, the complex part, and then when I'm fighting with Maddox, I was very oh surprised God. at how natural it all sounded. I was... It felt very cathartic. Oh, I bet. Like, uh, yeah, that, that 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 fight with Maddox, that is the moment that's kind of been one of those big things kind of been building. And by the end of episode nine, that fight between him and Maddox and the amazing voice actor who voiced Maddox too. Just, oh yes, oh, he was very man. good too. Mm-hmm. He he just went. He didn't go super crazy to the point where it's not realistic, but he really reveled in it and at first when i was casting 
I wanted, I thought I wanted Max to be like a younger version of Samuel to be that kind of, um, kind of cold and not big and loud kind of villain. And then the voice actor who I ended up casting, um, he went in kind of a different direction and gave him so much personality. And it was like one of those auditions where you can tell the voice actor is having fun. They're not really, of course, they like to be cast. They're not really thinking about like a cast this or not. I'm just going to have fun. Maybe that makes it stand out. Maybe this is also the director's looking for him just to have fun with it. And initially, I wanted Max to be like a younger Samuel, but then I thought it'll be interesting just because this guy is just really having fun with this audition. So I'm, I'm sure you can, I'm wondering if you can bring that to Maddox if I cast him. Because I, my thing is, I don't want to cast someone based on just how good their audition is. I'm hoping and trusting that they're going to bring that, especially if they're a pivotal character like. Gage or Anthony or Maddox or Samuel into the whole audio drama. So I decided to give him a chance and it was like the biggest chance I took on somebody because like if he doesn't sound right, I got to recast, which sucks. Um, you know, mm -hmm. to find someone in the process and also feeling like I'm going to be honest, I, you sometimes feel like it's a failure as a director to not have exactly what you were thought it was going to be. I took a chance on him, and by halfway through, he just, I thought, okay, this is, this is it. And by the time of that fight with H, he just really went cr crazy. Like, he's just so, made Maddox sound so sadistic, and just is all about getting revenge on, well, getting revenge on Gage in a way, for beating him, beating him in a fight one time, but that's obviously nowhere near the revenge Gage wants for killing his father. Um, but just really reveling on taking Gage down and then siding with Maddox to get filthy rights, all the stuff and be and be all about power and and he really starts to get unhinged by the time they have their fight. So but not to the point where it doesn't sound realistic. Yeah, I I think that, that really showed up with Maddox where it built up. At first Maddox was just like, Oh, um it just just pranks around the street things like that and it, it went from that to big city the rumble types uh the cops got involved all of that that was it, and it really showed maddox's willingness to take it super fur further it went up in levels it, it's, it's kind of hard to say because i'm like i'm thinking i was like how do i put this again so it's just climbing at this point so by the time we get to the end with maddox he's at this point where he just threw all caution out the window and he's he's ready to kill yeah and like an episode the end of episode five where he goes after like you know after gage and anthony are oh, I actually leave really back a little bit for episode four again showing what the kind of character I want anthony to be i didn't want him to all of a sudden turn into a strong badass like gage that's not his character but i didn't want him to be like this weak college kid either and the moment where um where isaac Ederson and dayton are in you know they're shooting up um, rebecca's diner and then i'm sh and those moments look where i'm hoping like i'm thinking about what the audience might be thinking but they just want to you know have gage go with them but then they say we're not through with you yet we know your little friend Anthony's in there. Bring him to us. And the gaps from their friends, that's kind of what I was hoping the, the listener thinks. But then the fact that Anthony, he just being around Gage and realizing that he's got to stand up for himself because his life is at stake. Literally, his life is at stake. And to see him be so brave. Um, and, you know, and the fact that he goes knowing what might happen, he... It's because he wants to protect Gage and look out for him. And then episode five where Max is like laughing maniacally as he's gets a switch lane, is trying to slice up Anthony and the screams that the screams Ryan did, I was I was expecting Gage to go hard with certain yelling, screaming and stuff. I was not expecting Ryan to go that hard as Anthony, and I messaged mm -hmm. him like those screams were insane. I wasn't expecting you to sound like that. Yeah, I was cringing as um, but I, I, I was cringing from hearing them and not in terms, not in the like, oh, that's crazy. We were, I was like, oh, I can feel that. Oh, God, type deal. That's yeah, deal. exactly. And then Max is just laughing maniacally and 
And then, of course, John as Gage is just screaming, no, stop, it's off his lungs. It was like, oh my god. Like, yeah. It's one of those things as a director that you hope for, but then the voice actors go to the next level. I, I, I confirm it to Attack on Titan, but I know what other show I've yeah. seen that has voice acting to that level. And, you know, this show is based in real life. It's not like this, it's not a dark fantasy with giant monsters, but what the characters go through, I wanted the audience to, like, I'm thinking this is, characters are screaming for their lives to, for themselves and for their friends and loved ones who are about to get eaten or killed by a titan. I want that same feeling to engage about to see Anthony get killed when Max is trying to slice him up. And so... I wanted that same feeling. Definitely good. All right. So it's been great, like, hearing from the both of you regarding this. And before we wrap up, we definitely want to know where we can find your work at, which will be linked in the description, by the way, people. And and before that, what's next? Starting with you, Joan. You've gone through this project. It's a big project, honestly. You did great and things. Where do you – what will you take from this and then move to the next project for? What's next? Well, let's see. To be honest, work ha- or voice acting work has been a bit slow, and that's because you know my job at the hospital. It takes a lot out of me, to be honest. Um, so, whenever I get a next job, I actually have one coming up where I'm helping out uh, this project owner dub a series of Spider-Man comics. I just recently finished voicing the vault, vo- voicing the Vulture for him, and I'm set to record for Wolverine. Oh, so nice. I'm going to be doing that. Yes. So I'm going to be doing that, I believe, this weekend, since I didn't really have a way to, to go over to that other house. But um, what else is next? I'm trying to save up for a an Apple computer, so that way I can use the, um, the new Neumann microphone I got sometime last year, but still haven't been able to use because my current laptop does not work with it, unfortunately. But after that... I want to try saving up to get a vocal booth just so that way, that way I have better audio quality. Yeah, I'm surprised that, that Jordan was able to pull it off as well as he did with with my recordings. Because I had to... Not only did I have to think about how the direction was, it also depended on how loud it was. And when I'm screaming in this little closet that barely has any any sound dampening, it peaks the microphone a lot, so... You know, always got to account for that. So, just one step at a time, I guess. Yeah, definitely. And especially in Neumann, like, the moment you plug those things in, they can hear flies spark from, like, down the street. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, it's important important to have a computer like, um, I think it's the Mac Mini M2. I've heard that that one is just dead silent. And my laptop does make a bit of noise, so I also got to account for that when I'm recording. Yeah, definitely. That's That's great to hear, honestly. And I definitely wish you well and to keep it up and before we close up jordan what's next for you you finished this project things it's it's been really exciting to listen to like remembering i'm like damn stuff uh what's next for you because i think it's clear that your your influences in anime and all that because i i do love the attack on titan dub okay and i completely agree it's great okay i don't give a fuck what anyone else, what anyone else said what's next for you like where do you what do you think you'll be doing in terms of this you working on a new story project that you'll be casting for things that you want that, that you're looking for and what do you think from this project has what have you learned from this project that could definitely influence you down the line um so in the springtime like this april i started writing a series called Into the Light. It's kind of in, it's a young adult um, magic fantasy series. It kind of goes in back and forth from a realistic setting to kind of a magical world setting. Um, it's one of the, it's one of the only audio dramas I've done that doesn't have any, have any swearing, bad language. And it wasn't so much I thought I was using too much of that because as you heard with Fight On, if it fits the character, who they swear a lot, I, I let it go. I, right. you know, I let that go because I want characters to be real. We don't censor ourselves in real life if we're pissed off at someone about something. But a couple ones I've done, like Into the Light, are, I guess, just don't have that. And maybe I've, I directed at a younger audience. And so that, I started in April writing that. And then the summer, I cast and directed people in it. 
Um, I believe episode three is out up to episode three on Spotify for part for podcasters, which is where you'll also find Fight on and a couple other audiobooks I've done. And so hopefully episode four will be out within the next couple of weeks and then throughout the fall, the episodes will be done. Um it's all recorded. Every all the voice actors just waiting on the audio to put everything together. Um in fact, um there's an audiobook I did before that one and earlier this year called Runaway Samurai. And getting all that together and getting all that mixed up, I getting all that mixed for the audio engineer was taking so long that I started writing the script for Into the Light before that was done. But Runaway Samurai is out on my Twitter. You can see that's where I post, you know, episodes of my audiobooks one at a time. Um, the IMDB for that is done. Runaway Samurai, I think Into the Light too. Um, I'm really proud of that one, uh, Runaway Samurai. It has a few more comedic moments than <laughs> my audio dramas have done, like Fight On being a perfect example. One thing about a lot of my audio dramas, I always say, is uh, get the tissue boxes. You're going to need them. Because uh, I said <laughs> some of my favorite animes are Fruits Basket, Attack on Titan. They hold nothing back on those intense emotional moments that make you really care about the characters and really just make you or make you glued to your seat wondering what's going to happen. I just, I'm always really drawn to that. So with Runaway Samurai, there's some of that. It's not as intense. And there's a few funny moments that, and <laughs> let me tell you, writing comedy was the biggest challenge for me. Like, I love, I love comedy shows, especially if you're having a bad day, just want something to make you laugh and forget about everything. Um, like with comedy anime, if they make you laugh, they did their job. That's it. Also, again, I'm always going to be supportive of I always in support English sub actors for anime. And I honestly think dubbing crazy wacky comedy is way harder than something as intense and emotional as like Attack on Titan. I think it's way harder because if you don't make the audience laugh, you fail. That's it. And it's really it's easier to connect with someone who's angry or who's heartbroken and, and crying and all this stuff than like a joke or a character doing something funny, you know, or doing something crazy. So I don't go as big as that. With Runaway Samurai, which is a different, a different thing for me. Of course, there's going to be some touching emotional moments, but nothing quite like this because I was, I, I was crying, listening to what John, all the voice actors did, because of what they brought and the fact that it was also, like I said at the beginning, my way of kind of letting go of Banana Fish and saying, "It's an amazing series, popular in America." Some of the content is the big reason why it probably will never get a dub. And when I say content, I don't mean gang wars, guns, violence, blood, death. That's nothing, honestly. Uh, some of the other content, and some, and most of it is implied as opposed to even seen. But I still think that's too much for anime studios in America to take a chance on. But hey, it is what it is. I, If I had seen that, I would have written my favorite audio drama. So... Runaway Samurai is completely done. People can check that out. And they can check out the episodes of Into the Light up to episode three or four, and then more coming in the fall. Sounds good. All right, so before we wrap up, just want to make sure that people know where to find you. Jordan, your socials, would you like to plug them and where they can find you at? Um, so my Facebook and Twitter is pretty simple. Jordan Taper, I... I'm not somebody that comes up with funny names for social because that makes it hard to find you. Um, is it just by your name? So you can find, I, I think on one of those, you can find a link to all my stories and audio dramas. If not, you can uh, go to a blogger and I think there, there will be a link here. Um, my name and then it'll say something like, uh, something like Jordan's writing and audiobooks. You'll find links to my stories and audio dramas. Good. I nice. highly recommend. I yeah, I highly recommend that you and listeners read along to the script mm-hmm. while listening to audio drama. I know that kind of goes without saying, but it really helps because you might get confused like what's happening. If you just bring along to the script, mm-hmm. it'll be easier to kind of keep track. Definitely, cool. Um, also, too, those links will be posted in the description. And speaking of links, John, where can people find you at in your work? That's it. You can find me on Twitter and YouTube at John McCord the Third. On Twitter, my my handle is JM3VA. I like to abbreviate it to Geneva, kind of like Geneva. Um, on my YouTube, 
I'll occasionally post I'll, I'll occasionally post like a meme or original idea I had every once in a blue moon. Um, and you can find me in sometimes various other places. Like for example, I voiced a minor character in uh, this detective thriller from a Finnish YouTuber who goes by Twisted Wisdom. They specialize in making machinima movies uh, in GTA V. Nice, nice, cool. And um, actually, I also wanted to mention one more thing. Your question from earlier was, what did I get out of this experience? I realized I didn't answer that. Um, so just wanted to do that real quick. Yeah. What I got from what I got from this ex from this uh, project was that I just need to keep that same energy when I go through other projects because the energy that I put into this one, it really elevate, I feel like it really elevated the experience of being able to listen to it. I'm very surprised at what I did. <laughs> <laughs> I I agree about the elevating experience because it it kept me attentive, and I think especially especially nowadays with things being more like short and to the point, uh, because more people don't pay attention. When you hear quality stuff like that, people could probably listen to that for a good hour or so. <laughs> so, so I would hope so. Yeah, I I sure as hell did. Like I listened to that through the whole whole damn morning. And things. I was mm -hmm. I was like next episode, next episode. Why is this not connecting right now, dude? Is there something wrong? Oh, I'm connected to a bad Wi-Fi. Unconnect. The next episode. Oh wait, I'm done. This stuff. So, so. Oh yeah, yeah, for sure. So I think it was great. That being said, both of you, I really appreciate you doing this. I it was great to hear fight on. I appreciate you encouraging me to go listen to the whole thing. Stuff. So it was great. It'll be linked. Everything that we just talked about will be linked in the description, including Fight On, where you can listen to it for free. Both John and Jordan socials, where you can contact them and follow their work. And yeah, once again, guys, thank you. Really appreciate it. And that being said, we'll see you guys later. Thank you. Thank you very much.